Wow, wow, wow. You're very motivated, Ajay. I cannot beat you. <laughs> you many, other, many other things like, like this. <laughs> good morning, Hello, Dr. Dr. Putra. And Hello, good evening, Dr. Atif. Yeah. How good are you? Morning. Good morning, sir. It's too early for you, I guess. Yeah. No, <laughs> start, sir. If, if you are in proper configuration, you may please turn on your video also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you can take, take some time. <laughs> no, 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 it's all right. Uh, good to see you also. Uh, the lecture will start in 15 minutes, right? Yeah, lecture will start in 10 minutes uh, from now. Uh, yeah, and then Jawad, the Jawad, is, Jawad is probably still in bed in Canada. No, 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 no. no. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Javed is joined. Javed is joined, but his video is not there. Yeah, you know, I came back but last night from Edmonton. I was, I was traveling from Edmonton. I'm back to Kingston. Javed, you become you, you become more active after coming from Calcutta to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> that is always the case, actually. I, what I have experienced. <laughs> Yeah, he he he's the one guy. He never takes the risk. He has a twenty-four hours turnaround. <laughs> no, not at all. It's um, yeah, it, but there's a little pending storm here. I mean, it's cloudy and rainy. It rained the whole night. Yeah, so, so, same. Uh, yeah, yeah, same. I think Canada brought the rain over here also. In North Jersey, we predicted like a storm. We have heavy rain. Uh, that's why I left my home. I thought my internet was disturbing, so I came to the company. All right. right. Yeah. Yeah. It's really early morning for you to come to the company at uh, 7 a.m. And, uh, and I open at 5 o'clock because you guys you guy advertise that talk will start 4.30 p.m. and 15 minutes 15 minute before you have to attend. Right. <laughs> 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 How do yeah. I share my slides here? Uh, okay, so I, let I'm us. Okay, let us have a test now. If you go yeah. in the downside of your uh, screen, then you see there is a mute symbol. After that, there is a uh, video symbol, which is like a camera camera symbol, yeah. and then you have a, a folder the kind of symbol. Yeah, share yeah. content upside arrow. Just click there. Click that. Yeah. And yeah, then switch it, to desktop. It says yeah, switch share to your desktop. screen. Yeah. Now you can uh, share your screen and whatever you have on the screen that will be displayed here. Let us make a quick test. I am trying. I think it's switching me to desktop uh, app. I was working from my browser. So I think that's yeah. what it is doing. Yeah, probably you select the screen. Uh, Origit, can you uh, enable uh, his presentation? Uh... Yeah, that's enabled. Actually, uh, oh. once I was static, he was using uh, log in to my bookstore browser. Get the uh, app open, then we can. Do okay, okay, yeah. Okay, so, starting, it's saying, it's saying starting your meeting. Yes, sir, please wait. Yeah, sorry, I'm I'm more used to of Zoom. I, I live on Zoom these days, but rarely use this WebEx. Yeah, we are using yeah. both actually Zoom and OEVX. Like uh, this, uh, all credit goes to Mr. Origit. We have taken and we was actually doing some uh, scheme either to have Zoom or uh, OEVX uh, for the chapter activities. There are so ma many activities we cannot rely on the section uh, platform. So we checked like OEVX was much more cheaper than Zoom. So we have purchased this OEVX platform. Uh, on behalf of MTTS Kerala chapter. Oh, that's a very good. Yeah. Still and, saying uh, start your meeting. Is it because I am already uh, in the meeting? Probably. The probably. It might be. Please, you may please log out and come through that one then. Okay. Take your time. We have enough time. Yeah. Yeah. We have time. Yeah. Well, uh, hello, Dr. Aprain. How are you? Uh, I think you are muted. Yeah, please unmute and then talk. And hello, Orijit, how are you? Sir, we are doing fine here. Thank you so much for how being here. Long time. And Dr. Yadav was there. I can, I can see him. Yeah, Dr. Yadav, 
No, I see. Uh, and Dr. Zubair Akhtar is there. It's Dr. Good. Zubair. Ha how are you doing, Zubair? Uh, I think you are muted. Please unmute. Yeah, I can see Dr. Sanjeev. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have two guests, Dr. Sanjeev and Dr. Zubair Akhtar. Yes. Thank you, thank you, sir. <laughs> Great to see you here. No, th this is wonderful opportunity to meet and interact with each other. Yeah, there are so many dedicated APS and MTTS volunteers over here. I see Dr. Samuganathan, he's the chair of uh, Madras. And then I see many, many actually. Uh, yeah, we have Diddi, we have Somavo, uh, he's from uh, the Jaipur, Jaipur chapter. Some student from Jaipur, chapter. yeah. yeah. So I've always there. I can see him. What a show. Yeah. So, Somia, Somia, you have to unmute. Yeah. Unmute and say hi. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, you are audible. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> we have our student branch uh, chapter chair, Miss Elizabeth, also. Elizabeth? Yeah. Elizabeth you may turn yes. on. Hello. Hello, everyone. Am I audible? I... Yes, you Hello? are. Okay. You are. It's nice meeting you all. Good evening, Elizabeth. Thanks. I think I, I think Elizabeth. I have received several emails from her. Uh, is there any issue left out? Yeah, it was resolve all things, if I remember. Yeah, we are planning for uh, some webinar with you, sir. So I'll I'll be contacting you, you soon. Okay. You are you, you have enough money in chapters? Ah, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, very good. Very good. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> this year, whatever you are, like whatever is given, that should be enough. <laughs> and uh, always you are always so gracious. Yeah. No, at least one at least one good I want I would like to thank you guys because at least I am ad member from both MTT and AP, so I can address the problem both the chapters. Yeah. <coughs> and, and 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 you want from region ten? We have a good candidate, Atif, and I think uh, you know it is not wise to as a committee member to say you know to vote someone. Yeah, it is your uh -huh. choice, but but he is very very good out the syndicate candidate. He will make a difference. Yeah. 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 I see Dr. Devdeep Sharkar also logged in. Devdeep, can you please turn on? And yeah, maybe he's taking some time. So these are all very much young and dedicated IEEE, APS, and MTTS uh, guys. Devdeep had a talk earlier in the day. Yeah, Devdeep, yeah today, today in, to some extent, I can say today is the webinar day in India. Like there are four or five webinars happening in different corners. Devdeep yeah. started today at IIT BHU. Then there was one at Jadapur University. And then we are having this one. Probably there is a couple of more after these also in different corners. Yeah, Dr. Vasudev Ghosh yeah. will come right? later. Yeah, Dr. Vasudev Ghosh has a talk on microwave filters. And then I yeah. think there is one more. I, I am somehow forgetting. Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Shah. I think I have uh, hi, tried hi, to. Hi. You know that my situation. I yeah, think. yeah, I know you need two devices. So if I yeah, turn yeah, on yeah. your video. <laughs> it is a, it is a like multiple device for me. Like I need to turn yeah. on in WebEx <laughs> from video from one and audio from one. <laughs> yeah, because you are you are MIMO person of India, maybe because of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, so I see. So how are you, Doctor? Put that. Good afternoon. I think yeah. today it's morning there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we yeah. we have we have early morning, sir. And good morning. evening to all of good evening to all you guys from India. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that <coughs> yeah. Doctor Samuganathan, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, you may extend and say hello to all. Yeah. Is no, the no, current... uh, Is it audible? Sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's audible. Yes. Sir? Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. I'm uh, Shantanandam. I am the chair of uh, Antenna Provence Society Madras section. So we are also working in Antenna's uh, uh, group in our university, Pondicherry Central University. The different uh, domains like uh, 
meta materials fractal antennas and then sw yeah. antennas yeah like that thank you be. thank you yeah. thank you so much anathan <laughs> professor samim is back and now we can see your uh, screen yes yeah Okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear. Yeah, we yeah. can see your screen. So screen as well. Yeah. Okay. Good. So yeah, let me know when to when to start. I yeah. don't know. How. Should I should yeah, stop? Yeah. Should I should stop yeah. sharing? Yeah. Yeah. You may stop for the time being. Uh, Orijit will uh, start the proceedings formally. Orijit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think we can start. So we'll start our event today. Good evening. I am Arijit from the SSC. On behalf of IEEE APS and APPS Society, Kerala chapter, welcome all of you into this virtual event. Well, we know the entire humanity is going through a very challenging time indeed. The outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic has moved the entire civilization before unprecedented challenges and imposed severe restrictions in our various phases of our life, like our work schedule, travel, and lifestyle. But the tremendous advancement of communication technology have enabled us to overcome all geographical barriers and equipped us with countless tools to get in touch with the world sitting at home. We at IGP Kerala chapter believe learning is a continuous process and we should not break the learning chain. This motto, we started our webinar series covering various fundamentals and ad hoc topics on RF microwave engineering and today's event is a continuation of the series. In fact, at this point, I'm very proud to announce that we had organized an event on 3rd May, which was for us, which, that was the time when the, our entire country was under lockdown. And with this for us, it's time in the art and region. And after which the initiative has propagated like anything, and as you can see nowadays, uh, such events are being organized regularly by various institutes and chapter, and it has emerged as a new way of learning and knowledge sharing, as we may say. So coming to today's event, today we have actually uh, two back-to-back -back events. Uh, we are really grateful to have with us uh, Dr. Atif Shamim, Associate Professor, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. He will be delivering a talk on the flexible, wearable, disposable wireless communication system through additive manufacturing. And this talk will be followed by a panel discussion on IEEE APS initiatives and opportunities with renowned panelists, which who are indeed uh, stalwarts in APPS and APS society. We have with us, uh, panel members Dr. Ajay Mutar, Professor Mashkar Gupta, Professor Tavaj Siddiqui, and Dr. Chinma Shah. I heartily welcome all of you once again. And uh, as a formality, I'll just quickly go through some of the webinar protocols. <laughs> well, the first uh, talk will be of around 45 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. I request all the uh, participants to keep your audio and video switched up during the entire presentation. If you are having any problems with hearing the audio, please adjust your computer system master volume. 
or you can also ensure whether your system speaker is enabled and selected in the WebEx platform. If you have any technical queries, please put your questions in the chat box in doors of the talk. In, during the question and session, we'll be addressing your questions. At the end of the session, we'll be sending <coughs> to our participants. Please fill the form details for participation certificates. This event is being recorded and also being live streamed in our YouTube channel and Facebook page. So in future, if you want to just tune in, you can you please log in to our channel for this event. So like uh, now we'll start with our event. At the beginning, uh, I request MPTS Kerala Chair and APS Kerala Immediate Bus Chair, Dr. Chinmay, to kindly uh, maybe say a few words about our chapter activi activities and then introduce the speaker. So thank you all. I hope you enjoy this event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Orijit. Firstly, my sincere thanks to Dr. Atif Shamim for accepting our invitation readily, and also to the panel members for agreeing to deliberate on this particular topic, the APS initiatives and future directions, Professor uh, Bhaskar Gupta, Dr. Rajoy Puddar, Professor Siddiqui, and I'll be moderating the panel. Firstly, I congratulate to my fellow office bearers of IEEE MTTS and APS Kerala and also the Government Engineering College Barton Hill for taking this initiative. It is indeed a great privilege and I would, I'm really honored to say that the AP, MTTS and APS Kerala chapter take this particular initiative when India started going in, in lockdown around mid-March. We came up with our first event in first week of May and as Origit mentioned, Later on, this particular webinar series has propagated like anything and different uh, versions and different type of webinars, sometimes events, seminars also, and colloquium are being organized by different other organizations. As you know, this is the new normal, and at least it is going to stay for uh, maybe a couple of years or so. And perhaps you have seen various renowned conferences like MTTS conference, IMAs, then APS uh, annual symposium this year went virtual, in fact, UCAP, and then upcoming 5G World Forum that's going to happen in Bangalore in September, uh, mid-September, all this has gone virtual. So this is a new technique, a new way of learning. I mean, as the tagline uh, to combat the pandemic was break the chain, but we, the academicians and the technologists must ensure that the learning chain is never broken. So I won't take much time, just uh, you know, share a few informations with respect to our chapter activities. APS Kerala started this journey in 2014. And in fact, uh, way before the Kerala was organizing a focused AP conference antenna propagation symposium. And since to has become a hallmark of one of the AP conferences that happens in India. And apart from that, over the last couple of years, we have come up with five new student run chapters of AP Society. And th thanks to all support from the society and all the leaders, and including uh, Dr. Ajay Poddar, I mean, due to our activities, our, uh, you know, it was recognized and we got the best chapter award, APS Best Chapter Award in 2018. MTT Society, which is really very close to the AP Society, we have started journey in last year only. Professor Cole, uh, Dr. Uh, Chattopadhyay, uh, Professor Siddiqui, uh, Dr. D.C. Pandey from DRDO all came together at Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology to inaugurate this particular MTT society. And already just within a year, we were pretty vibrant. I all uh, sincere thanks to my uh, fellow office bearers, Mr. Rojit Mitro, Anu Mohammad, and uh, quite a few of my students, Gopika, Elizabeth, Binod, and others who are really hardworking and who are the real pillars for this particular chapter and as you know ITPLE Kerala section is one of the largest section across the globe where we are always within the top 10 globally and you know thanks to the support from the section as well as society chapters both APS and MTTS we are growing and I believe we will grow further and as I mentioned and as Orijit mentioned this is not just a standalone activities uh, I mean already this is a series of webinars this is the eighth uh, version today going on and there are quite a few more in the pipeline. So with this, I uh, conclude my talk, and now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Atif Shamim, today's speaker. Dr. Uh, Shamim uh, received his MS and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from Carleton University, Canada in 2004 and 2009, respectively. He was an NS 
ERC Alexander Graham Bell graduate scholar at Carleton University from 2007 to 2009 and NSERC postdoctoral fellow uh, in 2009-2010 at RMC Canada and Coast. In August 2010, he joined the electrical engineering program at Coast, where he is currently an associate professor and principal investigator of Impact Lab. He was an invited researcher at the VIT Micromodules Research Center. In 2006, his research work has won best paper awards in multiple conferences like IEEE EUWIT 208 2008, IEEE IMS 2016, IEEE MECAP 2016, first prize in IEEE IMS IWA 2006, and so on and so forth. He was given the Ottawa Center of Research Innovation Researcher of the Year Award in 2008 in Canada. His work on wireless dosimeter won the ITAC SMC award at Canadian uh, Microelectronics Corporation Texpo in 2007. Professor Shamim also won numerous business related awards, including first prize in Canada's national business plan competition and was awarded OCRI Entrepreneur of the Year award in 2010. He was recently won the King's Prize for Best Innovation of the Year for his work on sensors for all the for the oil industry. He is an author and co author of 25, 250 international publications and inventors on 25 patents and has given over 50 invited talks at various international forums. His research interests are in the innovation, innovative antenna design, and their integration strategies with circuits and sensor for flexible and wearable wireless sensing systems through a combination of CMOS and additive manufacturing technologies. Dr. Shamim is a senior member of IEEE founder and the first IEEE APMTT chapter chair in Saudi Arabia in 2013 and served on the editorial board of IEEE transactions on antennas and propagation 2013 to 2019 and as a guest editor of IEEE AWPL special issue in 2019 and is currently serving as an associate editor for IEEE Journal of Electromagnetics, RF and Microbe in Medicine and Biology. So with this introduction, I request Professor Shamim to take care. Over to you, Professor Shamim. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Saha, for this uh, nice introduction and the opportunity. And I also want to extend thanks to Ajay and Jawad, who made, made the bridges, who made the introduction and made this happen. And uh, also uh, Sivada to be organizing this. And I hope I, I have many friends here, and I hope I, I will make some new friends uh, in this. And, and congratulations to the Kerala chapter for uh, the, this outstanding work. Uh, and I'm I'm very glad to be part of this uh, this effort and uh, ho and glad to share my work. So I'm without wasting much time, I'm gonna try to share my screen now, and because uh, I'll I'll try to finish within 45 50 minutes. I hope. Typically, uh, it doesn't happen. Uh, can you see my screen now? Can you guys see my screen? Yes, it's starting, sir. It's, it's, it's getting loaded. Yeah. Let me know when it's. So can you guys see now? Yes, I can see now. We can see. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great, uh, great, great. Uh, so uh, my, the title of my talk is pretty long, uh, but I just wanted to put the keywords there. Uh, I like to work on flexible and variable and very low cost to the extent disposable wireless communication systems, uh, and the mode is through additive manufacturing. So this talk is is about about that. This is the, the campus. Uh, I hope when I change the slide here, you guys can see. Can you guys see the campus as well now? The screen? No, we can see the first slide only. The title so, slide. So this means there's a slight delay when I change the, change the slide. Yes. Okay, so how do I see I, Have you shared the screen? Uh, yeah, now we yeah, see the now, campus. So it is all about delay, actually. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, there's some delay uh, in that. Uh, anyways, uh, this is uh, the campus of KAUST, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. 
uh, this is relatively a new university, like started in uh, 2009, uh, right on the Red Sea. It's a beautiful campus. Um, just uh, the university is just postgraduate, uh, uh, which means that we only have master's, PhD, and kind of postdoc studies. Uh, we don't have any undergraduate programs. So the university is focused on the uh, on the uh, graduate studies only. This is another uh, view. I think it's gonna it's gonna load uh in a in some time but it's just showing you the city uh over there okay so with this kind of introduction let me go towards uh, the motivation for my talk um again i don't know how much delay is there so this is there a way i can find out what you guys are seeing i am also seeing the same thing or not not much maybe uh, 3 to 4 seconds not much okay 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 yeah. And, and it depends on individual's internet connection also. So we cannot do anything on that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. So I, I don't want to be talking about some slide which does not appear, but, uh, but hopefully this is now. So if you look at the trends in electronics, right? So you've gone from, if you look at the time that you've gone from very bulky, expensive, single function systems. And if you move on now, you look at your smartphones and your smart watches, uh, you, you see that basically they are... Uh, uh, they are small in size, lightweight, conformal. Uh, they have multiple functions in them. And I believe the next in line in, uh, is, is are the variable sensors and the IoT network. A part of IoT network, the humans will also be wearing uh, a lot of sensors to be connected to their environment. Uh, uh, so the trend is uh, uh, pretty clear uh, here, uh, which is smaller size, lower cost, and enhanced functionality. And these are kind of the keywords which are uh, motivation for my research uh, or research in my lab. Uh, we want to go smaller in size, lower cost, enhanced functionality, add more functionality to be consistent with the electronics. Now, talking about applications, of course, there are some existing applications. RFID is a multi-billion dollar market. And you know the major aspect for RFID, uh, RFIDs now is the cost. So our RFID tag right now, uh, costs around 25 cents, uh, but uh, the, their efforts going on to bring it down to a cent or two, right? So that's where uh, the major effort is. Otherwise, it's a kind of mature technology. Uh, uh, other than that, IoT, Internet of Things, is emerging. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of aspects for Internet of Things. But uh, th the most important or relevant for me are the communication and sensing. Because if the machines or the normal non-living non objects have to make smart decisions, they need to sense like humans, and then they need to communicate this information. So, so that's why this uh, sensing and communication is of interest. And now these sensors and communication modules need to be installed on billions of devices. If you look at the, the future of Internet of Things, they have to be installed on billions of devices. So this means that they need to be uh, uh, low cost and have to have do the volume manufacturing and they need to be conformal so that they can be placed on objects which are not planar. Uh, these are kind of con uh, more conventional applications, but I, because the, uh, the talk is on, on printing and additive manufacturing technologies, I want to show that this is not restricted to, to the lab only. There are new applications which are being developed. So here you see uh, temp track, which is a, a, a Bluetooth tag, printed Bluetooth tag uh, for, for children. You know, if somebody who's parent here, he knows that taking the temperature of a sick child is, is painful through a thermometer. So, so this is a flexible sticker which goes on the child body and through Bluetooth, it keeps on giving information to the parent's uh, phone about the temperature. So very convenient. And uh, this would not have been possible uh, with the existing rigid PCB technology. Right, so so uh, that's uh, what the advantage. So uh, next, I show you uh, the HVAC system for Mitsubishi wagon. This is already in the uh, Mitsubishi model, so it's all printed. Uh, and then another company I came across, Bebop Sensors. They print sensors on the insoles of, to monitor activities. And this is a Norwegian company uh, which uh, do these uh, NFC stickers exactly printed to find out if the, there is any uh, counterfeiting. Uh, or unauthorized refills for the for the bottles. So these are all uh, interesting examples of of uh, the, the printing technology, uh, which is now uh, you know going into the industry. At the same time, three D printing 
is also called as like the third industrial revolution. Uh, and uh, in addition to our, our field, there's a lot of uh, walks of lives where uh, 3D printing is being used. So I'm showing you a picture where a prosthetic arm uh, is shown, which is just made for $1.50, used to be very expensive from 3D printing. I like this one. This is the International Space Center. Uh, they had the 3D printer up there in the uh, Space Center and they 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 sent uh, they got the file and they printed the tool which they needed right there. So this is rapid prototyping, uh, rapid prototyping, prototyping or on demand prototyping. Uh, everything which this model is wearing is basically uh, uh, 3D printed. Uh, amazing shoes are being 3D printed. So electronics is not far behind, and you know there's a lot of interest in 3D printing as well. So 3D printing, inkjet printing, screen printing, all different forms of additive manu additive manufacturing. Now, I want to tell you what is the difference between additive and subtractive manufacturing, why additive manufacturing can be more cost efficient. Uh, so this is uh, what you see right now is the traditional manufacturing subtractive. Whether you do a PCB design, printed circuit board design, or where you would want to create your layout, let's say your antenna. So what you do, you, you basically have a metal cladded PCB on both sides. One side can be a ground plate, but the other side you need to create a uh, a pattern. So that pattern, how do you create? You etch the metal out. There could be different ways to etch the metal out. This could be mechanical etching, this could be wet etching, dry etching. But one way or the other, you would remove the metal. You would remove the material. That's why it is called subtractive uh, manufacturing. Similarly, if you go to the clean room, uh, nanofabrication or microfabrication, there you would have these very expensive masks to create your pattern. You deposit the material completely and then you put the mask and then you remove the material which you do not want. So these are classical examples of subtractive manufacturing. So what do you need? You need expensive masks and for clean room you need expensive uh, like a vacuum based processes and then you waste material. So most importantly is you're depositing the material everywhere and then you are removing it, right? So you're wasting material. Contrary. Uh, to this subtractive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing is as simple as you are printing in your home and office environment. So you have the right ink, you will have the pattern which is digital in your computer, it's a digital file, and then you press print and it will only deposit the material where it is required on the substrate and will make the pattern digitally without wasting any material. No expensive masks are required, everything is digital. So this is uh, very interesting. Uh, and uh, that's why it is called as uh, additive manufacturing, where you do not waste uh, material. Now, uh, recently this uh, field has picked up uh, a lot because uh, the nanoparticle-based inks are becoming successful. Previously, we could never get conductivities uh, close to the metal, uh, bulk metals conductivity, so it was never uh, in the mainstream. But now, uh, and I would also show in my talk, uh, there's a number of inks which you can, uh, can, can use. Uh, printing is also compatible with the flexible substrates. Uh, so uh, like paper, uh, plastics, uh, uh, leather, you know, the, the, all these substrates are non-conventional for electronics. But with printing, you could realize uh, uh, electronics on, on these flexible substrates. And also with printing, you can enable roll-to-roll -roll or reel-to-reel -reel processing. Uh, so... Presently, I think there's a there's a printer which can take a one meter by one meter sheet, and it can print uh, with uh, I think uh, speed of uh, uh, forty meters per second. So imagine a one meter by one meter sheet going through printing of forty meters per second. How many micro micrometer and millimeter scale devices you will be able to print in one second? So that's the kind of volume. I'm talking about, and that's the kind of convenience I'm talking about. Uh, people like me who are working in this area, uh, our dream is that uh, we can print electronics like newspapers and magazines. You've seen newspapers being printed in big rolls. Uh, so, so that's what we want to do. We are not there yet, but uh, there's a lot of work going on and some of the work I want to show you uh, and some of the challenges we'll also discuss. Now, because most of the audience here in this talk are from the RF antennas background and probably may, may, maybe many of you are not familiar with the printing. So I just have two or three slides uh, as just the basic introduction to this kind of uh, printing, uh, what we do. And, and now, you know, uh, I'm a conventional RF microwave kind of a guy. By training in Canada, I was doing, I was designing CMOS chips. 
RFICs. Uh, but then I got into printing and, and now I, actually my lab is also making inks. Uh, so, so I've learned a little bit about uh, material science as well. Uh, so what do you do? We can make our own inks. Actually, the first step is to make nanoparticles. How do you make the nanoparticles? You take the right metal salts. For example, if you want to make silver ink, you will take a silver nitrate. Nitrate, for example, a reducing agent is basically a chemical which will make the metal ions into pure metals. And the capping uh, agent is something uh, which caps the nanoparticles so that they cannot uh, mix with each other and form lumps. I will talk more about it in a minute. Then once you make this mixture, you put it in a glass baker and then you start heating it. When you start heating it, it starts to uh, make small metal nuclei. You know, and as you keep on heating, these metal nuclei uh, kind of uh, uh, keep on growing. Now, if you uh, look at uh, these guys, the, the nanoparticles, uh, you would see the there's a red kind of boundary outside them. This is the capping agent. So this is kind of a polymer. We also call it, call it as a ligand. The purpose of this polymer is that the, these nanoparticles, they do not uh, join each other to form big lumps. Otherwise, you cannot print them. So we want them to stay as nanoparticles or, uh, once we print them. After the printing, we heat them and we make uh, traces. So, so remember these capping agents or, or, or polymers. Uh, and then you kind of do a centrifuge step where you kind of uh, mix it and, and rotate it, and then you can get, uh, get your inks. Uh, this is a, like a picture of a silver nanopore ink. Uh, and then I just want to show you quickly how a basic piezo print head, uh, printer works. So you know all know piezoelectric materials. So these are the materials which deform when an electric field is applied to them. So, so if you have a piezo material and you can apply a voltage across it and you, you connect a vibration plate, so then you could create a kind of a structure which is which, which you can see here. Now this if sits on a on a nozzle uh, and then which has the ink. So whenever you apply a voltage, uh, this will drop uh, 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 some ink. So the, an ink drop will be formed. And then multiple nozzles, when they operate simultaneously, they can form these traces. So when you're printing with a piezo kind of a printer, you basically uh, define a voltage wave. And that voltage wave on across all the nozzles will dictate how your printing happens. Now, remember when I talked about uh, the, 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 the ligands or these capping agents. So once you have printed, now there is a solvent. Of course, the ink is liquid, so there is solvent. And uh, we need to get rid of that. And we also need to get rid of this capping agent. So what we do is that we start heating. Uh, the traditional way is heating, but uh, there's a number of ways where you can do, uh, and this process is called sintering. So you could use uh, lasers, phot uh, photonic sintering, other methods, a conventional oven. Uh, and uh, eventually you melt, you evaporate the solvent and you melt the, the capping agent. So now these nanoparticles, metal nanoparticles are free to form a continuous traces. So you keep on centering them and then you could see conductive patterns. So we have seen from the experience that higher the temperature you apply for centering, the better conductivity you could get and the better uh, transpiration, uh, better uh, uh, traces are there. Now, when you talk about printing, paper comes to your mind, right? Because from 100 years, we have been printing on paper, whether it's newspaper, magazine, or whatever, a poster. We've always been printing on, 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 on paper, but we never print electronics. But however, this is also changing. People are printing uh, solar cells, RFIDs, RF circuits, sensors. A lot of work is being done on the paper substrate. And why paper? Paper is actually the cheapest substrate on planet Earth. It is one-tenth of the cheapest plastic which we have. So the plastic bottle which you drink water in and throw it, the paper is 10 times cheaper than that. And then you have... Uh, uh, it's, it comes from a renewable source, uh, so it's it's environmentally friendly. So it's a very good uh, source. Now, before getting into the examples of uh, uh, the the RF designs or antenna designs, uh, we just uh, when we started, we started uh, doing the characterization to see how we can print. So we printed different traces, we centered at different temperatures and durations, different substrates and in properties. In the nutshell, we saw that as you print more layers you can get higher conductivity and this conductivity can actually go up to uh, 10 per 7 Siemens per meter, which is very close to the bulk conductivity of 
the metals like which we typically use like silver and copper uh, gold gold which are around 5 into 10 per 7 siemens per meter so we are almost uh, close to that of course uh, this is a combination of the more number of layers you print and the more sintering you do uh, you get uh, this kind of behavior now in terms of feature sizes this uh, uh, table is uh, is kind of uh, for a dramatic fujifilm desktop printer uh, you could get a minimum gap of 20 micron minimum trace width of 20 micron each trace which you print is 0.5 micron so if you want to have let's say 3 micron of uh, of thickness you will uh, can print like six layers and you will have six almost six micron this also depends on the nanoparticle thickness which you, you which you also can control in the process of making those and as i said you could get a decent conductivity uh, from 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 this uh, 3 micron or 2 micron uh, trace now I have a new printer in my lab, uh, which is called a super inkjet printer. Uh, with this, we can actually now print uh, to sizes up to one micron, so which is amazing. And uh, this is some work which will be used for higher frequencies uh, designs. When I started doing printing uh, many years ago, uh, maybe seven, eight, or ten years, no, eight years ago, approximately, everybody used to put their uh, whatever design they had done into an oven and heat it for two hours. So when I started doing this, uh, sometimes the paper substrate or sometimes the plastic would melt. And then I would question, why do I have to do this? Because I only want to heat the trace, the metal trace, the printed trace. Uh, so why do I want, want to do this? So, so I tried, the, I had a laser, a CO2 laser, 10.6 micron laser. So I put it on full power and I just focused it on the metal trace and uh, tried to heat it. So the results were amazing. Uh, we got the same performance which you would typically get from a two hour oven sintering. Uh, we got it in like 10 minutes, the same conductivity, same performance and without affecting the substrate. So this, uh, this was very, very uh, encouraging uh, result for us. And then we, we, we started using this laser sintering as one of the techniques uh, to do that, uh, do the designs. Now, after this basic introduction to the additive manufacturing or printing, uh, printing uh, I just want to go show some examples of my labs. Uh, I, the, this is most of most of the things are overview because I want to show you the the kind of work which we do. Every project uh, is can have a detailed presentation of itself. Uh, I will be happy uh, to to answer uh, questions on a specific project if you are interested. Okay, but I just want to show you some examples here. So this is uh, I will showing you uh, an antenna design, an early design which we did. Uh, we wanted to do it for ultra wideband so you could see that this is like a more pole but in between we have a triangular fractal kind of a matching circuit so uh, or matching element you could say so this is part of the antenna but because of the multiple resonances which the fractal can have we can have a wider bandwidth to it and also not only the fractal helps us to have wider bandwidth but also it can help us reduce the ink consumption so look the only cost which which is there is the ink uh, which is also cheap because we're just using pico liters, but we can save some ink with these kind of designs. And this is the, the printed prototype. You could see the front and top printed on a paper substrate. Uh, the back side is the ground plane. Uh, of course, it is a bit uh, uh, curved uh, to have help with the bandwidth. And this is just showing you the simulated and measured results. You could see that it is, it is uh, kind of very wide band. It's working as good as a PCB antenna and a decent radiation pattern, a uh, decent gain. Uh, so the performance is as good as uh, as a PCB antenna. Uh, you could print as many as po possible. Uh, it costs you cents. And the advantage is you use it. After the use, you could crumble it, throw it in in the dustbin, you know, and print another one if you don't want to use it again. Uh, so so that's the advantage of these very very low cost disposable kind of uh, antennas. Now uh, these can be uh, flexible as well. I'm going to show you. Another antenna design which I will show you is multiband. Uh, one of my students uh, loved to do multiband antennas. Uh, so here, if you look at the, if you look at the uh, design strategy, if you look at antenna one, antenna two, uh, and uh, antenna three, uh, every time you have a slot, you can you enhance, uh, you add a resonance. And if you if you're smart enough to place these resonances close to each other, you could have a wideband design. Or if you don't want a wide band design, you want a multi band design, you could place these resonances away from each other. So this is controlled uh, by the 
this is controlled by the uh, uh, by the slots. So then also the slots are in the in the ground plane. In the ground plane there are also slots. So this is kind of working on like five or six bands which are uh, relevant for the uh, Wi-Fi or uh, 3G and all those WiMAX bands. Uh, again, the printed uh, antenna is shown front and back. Uh, very easy. You print it in in few minutes, uh, and then you are ready to go uh, to use it. Now we also tried to uh, make make them flexible. So there are two kinds of paper substrates which we have used. So the conventional paper which I'm showing you has a, like a photo paper has a has a polymer coating on it. So when we heated it, we realized that whatever shape you heat it, it retains it. And the reason for that is that there's a polymer coating, so which will basically get hardened, and and so so it retains its shape, which is good for uh, conformal applications. So, for example, if you want to put an antenna on a human arm, or if you want to put an antenna on a pole, you know the radius. You could basically heat it in that fashion. However, there are other types of papers where there's the polymer coating is not there, so they they remain flexible after heating as well. So you could bend them whatever way you want. Uh, they they work very well in flexing as well, and the beauty of printing is that you could print on a number of substrates. As you could see here on the right side top, you see we printed a, a, a dual band antenna on on a leather substrate, right? Uh, and we also printed a multi band antenna on a captain plastic substrate, which is also flexible. Uh, we even printed on a textile on a normal T-shirt. Right, which I will uh, talk about a little bit more uh, later on. So, so, so this is the stuff which you cannot probably do with the conventional uh, PCB technology. Now, I, I want to show you uh, another flexible design. Uh, this is just a parasitic beam switching array. Uh, you could do this. Uh, uh, this a basic antenna, one patch antenna, which is fed, and then you have parasitic antennas close to it. Like on the left side, you have the open. Uh, circuited elements and the right side you have short circuit so with this combination of open circuit and short circuit you could actually uh, uh, tilt the beam this is called a, a, a passive or parasitic uh, way of tilting the beam uh, but you could see that the beam is quite wide so so in order to make the beam narrow we used a, 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 a partially reflective surface uh, which is a repetitive structure uh, kind of fss so you look at the stack up where there's a ground plane, there's substrate, then there's your feed antenna and the, 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 the passive array. And then on top of that is a, is a partially reflective surface, uh, which can make your beam narrow. Uh, and we've made three versions of it, uh, which, are, which are also, this is the printed versions. You could see that they are again conformal and flexible uh, and uh, they can, uh, they can uh, switch the beam within plus minus 32 degrees. Uh, and with a maximum gain of 13 dBi at 77 gigahertz. So this paper just came out. I, I forgot to put the reference for it, but if somebody is more interested in this, you can see. So in a parasitic way, a flexible way, you are able to uh, switch the beams. Um, I'm going to show you another example, but this is like a system level example. Uh, very interesting uh, how this project started. Uh, at at a dinner, one of my friend was telling his story about his his toddler, two year old son in a shopping mall who got lost. Uh, and they were panicking, and the son eventually they found him after 30 minutes. Uh, but they were like, uh, you could you can imagine what happened to the parents. So uh, he was narrating this story to me uh, over dinner, and I said, they, with all this technology, you should be able to find your son. Uh, and I'm talking about this few years, few years back, uh, three four years back. And uh, he said, how? And I said, okay, let me put a graduate student on this problem, and we will try to figure. out. So that's how this project started, uh, and we uh, but we created a, a variable system. Uh, which works for both outdoor and indoor uh, uh, localization tracking. Outdoor, of course, is easy. You you can uh, you can have GPS, and then you could send your coordinates through GSM or GPRS. And then we made our own central server. We have the monitoring devices, any internet-enabled devices, the monitoring device. So you could pull up the Google Map, and you could start seeing the person who's wearing that that tag uh, or a bracelet. Indoor, uh, we, we relied on, on Wi-Fi because the GPS signals goes down indoor. So as soon as the GPS signal goes down, you're indoor, this hooks up to Wi-Fi and, and then sends the, the coordinates to the Wi-Fi. And, and that's, I think, probably the, the, the innovative part in our approach. If you could see the conventional GPS-based system, this is a test which we did at Kaust. Uh, the red one, when, when the person goes inside the building, you cannot trace it. 
but with our tag the green one that green dots you could see that uh, they can actually uh, trace inside the buildings as well this was also printed and the first this was the first time we did a multi layer printing and we actually did a printed circuit board you could see it's a pretty complex printed circuit board and then we have two three layers were one or two for the circuits battery and the sims and then there were three antennas uh, all for gps gsm and wi-fi and uh, we have a full uh, like a system a web server where you could log in for and see for your tag and we can track this is a measured result we can track within three to four meters of uh, accuracy uh, with this now this work actually uh, went beyond the research project and and the student who was working on this uh, started a company now the company is actually a, the, this product has evolved called albuster tracking and and is offering this solution to shopping malls or theme parks and other crowded places uh, where the people need to track their kids uh, so it's a variable which is now uh, on commercialization track when i was doing this project i thought we are printing on paper uh, so can we uh, can we print directly on the textile so it will be very cool if we, if we can print this localization module on the on the t-shirt of a child right so with this we started printing on the textile this is the scm of a of a co common like the t-shirt which cotton t-shirt which you wear uh, we could not print efficiently on this t-shirt because there were a lot of pores and holes so the ink would just go through holes so we printed an interface a dielectric layer on top of it uh, so the yellow one the the, the yellowish green one is the t-shirt uh, material and uh, then we were able to print on it and you could see uh, different types of uh, materials pure cotton and some polyester and cotton mix and we were able to print on all of them and they were pretty flexible and and, and so it was interesting i'm going to skip you the details of printing but here is a, a localization module uh, which is just uh, wi-fi based we did not put the gsm and all those on this uh, because it was for a smart campus uh, so you could see the uh, it's uh, like a planar kind of inverted f antenna p f antenna and then the uh, the the layout for the circuit is all printed uh, and shows some uh, of the antenna results this is my student who's wearing this t-shirt and testing so with the wi-fi based localization uh, we were able to on average uh, track it around uh, 10 to 15 15 meters uh, radius uh, which is not as good as the GPS based, uh, but this is much more power efficient. And I think uh, if there's a lost child and the parents can get uh, up to 15 meters uh, in vicinity to the child, they can actually find that child. So it was very interesting. Uh, so I was presenting this work in a, in a conference and one of the guys asked me, oh, that's great. You are printing on, on textiles, electronics. What about washing them? What happens to them when you wash them? and i scratched my head and i said no oh, that's a very good question uh, let me figure this out so that led to uh, we started working with some uh, stretchable inks and the inks which were water resistant and, and as a proof of concept we just did a very small uh, simple filter with the two shorted stubs and we just wanted to see we printed this filter on a stretchable like the textile material which the athletes athletes wear like the stretchable material so we printed on that and uh, we also printed uh, printed with the stretchable ink and we also printed with non-stretchable ink the stretchable ink, ink just has some polymers in it uh, and these are just showing the printed versions which are stretched and as you could see the non-stretchable ink got cracked as soon as we stretched it it got cracks and it would not work so this is the right graph uh, you see that it works and then it doesn't work uh, or where's the uh, stretchable ink it would develop a little bit of uh, some cracks uh, at 30 percent of stretching but as soon as you release it they, they fill up again so so it was still working till 25 to 30 percent of stretching which is typical for a for a, a textile which is uh, stretchable we also did like washing ex, uh, experiment on it so we we had a coating we had a dielectric coating on it again uh, this and uh, after a few washes we tested it again we did wash we tested again and it was working fine so which means that you could actually uh, have these electronics and have this coating and wash them and 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 still they would are expected to work now uh, also interesting for uh, the antenna designers or the rf designers is uh, uh, how to create vias because sometimes you do multi layers and sometimes you do the siw structures a uh, substrate integrate waveguide structure so how do you do this printing so we took a pmma substrate like a conventional substrate 
a thick sub substrate and then we drilled a hole through a laser and then we tried to print uh, in it in uh, in it but that was not very successful because uh, the ink would not stick to the vertical wall and because the substrate was very thick we would need a, a lot of uh, uh, layers to to print to get one via was so not practical was not practical so we thought of a solution we we actually created a, in, a staircase on both sides if you could see in this figure we have staircases this is created through laser from one side and then the staircase on the other side and then we print it and and that that actually worked because on the horizontal layers the ink uh, ink uh, was able to uh, stay and, and we with just five layers of printing we got a decent decent vias you could see some pictures on on the right side and uh, this is just showing that we have uh, uh, almost 0.2 ohm of a resistance uh, for one via which was which was great uh, uh, quite matching to the to the pcb based via now we created a siw structure this was just a, a microstrip to uh, a siw waveguide uh, transition but later on we also did uh, some work on on antennas and filters and and this worked very well so so you could create actually vias through printing you could create your whole structure through printing and, and it, it works well but basically now i've just shown you so far the printing of metallic ink so on conventional and unconventional substrate but the idea of printing uh, everything means that we also want to print the substrates we also want to print the dielectrics and for that matter we developed uh, a, a ink uh, an organic ink pvp ink as a dielectric and we created a multi layer process you could see at the bottom here so you could have a metal layer and then you could have dielectric layers and there's an interesting via here as well and then you have another dielectric layer uh, this via is a, called a dissolving type of via it's, it's 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 because these these layers are thin so we do not need any laser or anything like the previous slide i showed you here what we do is when we print the dielectric layer we actually don't heat it when it is wet we pass the metallic ink from where we want the via so the metallic ink just seeps through, reaches the other side, and then we heat it, and then it solidifies, and no more ink seeps through. And then you could print metal on it. So that's why you can print multiple layers, and you can connect them through vias. And we we did a lot of inductors and capacitors and antennas in this process. This is showing you the vias and the inductors. Now you know the lab has come a long way. Uh, we can actually now hack the 3D printers. We can uh, take the 3D printers ink. And and make it work with the with the 2D metallic printers and vice versa. So so and and we uh, we can now center through UV flash lighting infrared, uh, a lot of processes. So we combined 3D printing, 2D printing, different kind of printers, different centering mechanisms, and we have a number of uh, processes. Uh, so lab has come a long way on that. Uh, I think few years ago we showed the first fully printed, fully 3D and uh, inkjet printed uh, filter. Uh, uh, which worked very well uh, with this process. So, so, so that's uh, something which is in the fully printing domain. Now, also we've been working on 3D printed antennas. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I'm just going to show you. Uh, uh, this is a honeycomb antenna. You can see the complexity of this antenna. It's like a, a circular patch antenna on the top, but the substrate is honeycomb. And we removed this uh, substrate. We made this substrate through 3D printing because this becomes very lightweight. Uh, and the antenna becomes very efficient, uh, right? Uh, so, so if you want to make this kind of substrate uh, through conventional milling methods or other methods, this will take uh, hours and days. Uh, we would just go and, 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 you know, less than an hour or so, we would be able to print this antenna. Other slot antennas, waveguides, uh, we created these helical antennas, we pr printed lenses with 3D printing. So there's a lot of body of work uh, done on the, on the 3D printed antennas as well. Now, uh, sir, I'm very sorry, sir. Very sorry to interrupt, uh, sir. Uh, we are actually running out of time. Maybe uh, just maybe ten to fifteen minutes. You can just speed up a bit. How how much time I'm left with? Uh, maybe ten minutes, sir. Okay, ten minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna just uh, start my stopwatch and try to uh, show you a few examples. I may not be able to finish everything, but so antenna on package uh, concept. What is an antenna package? This is, by the way, becoming very popular, the antenna package concept. And I know Sony Ericsson, IBM, uh, with another company, uh, they are doing a lot of work on this. So this is now catching up with the industry. What is the concept here? The concept here is the bare die, the IC integrated circuit needs to be packaged. You see this black one. 
And this package then goes on the motherboard or the system board, right? But this package, black package, and the whole packaging industry, they, they, a lot of money spent, but this package does not do anything. So the idea of a system on package or end-on package is, can you realize the antennas on the package? So which means that the die, the bare die RFIC, which you see here, uh, can be connected to an antenna which is made on the package because package has space. So, so you could make compact and low cost systems and you can make the package functional. That's the basic concept behind antenna on package. So we've done a lot of work in this, in this domain. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples uh, only for this part. So this is an, uh, a work where we've designed an antenna on package. You could see the battery in the model in the, and, and the electronics is inside the package. Uh, the package has been 3D printed. And the, the, this is a GSM antenna, which is supposed to work on both bands. And one additional thing which we were trying to do was because this is, was for, for an IoT application, we wanted a kind of a near isotropic pattern. So we want whatever is the orientation of this package, whatever is the orientation of this box, we should have some coverage. We should have some radiation. So we wanted a near isotropic pattern. So the whole, uh, uh, this paper has actually all the theory, uh, all the theory we derived, uh, and then we did the simulations and the design. Uh, eventually, I'm just showing you the final design. This is uh, like a design which is all uh, around uh, the package electronics is inside. You feed it, it works at dual band. And and uh, uh, this, see, this is convenient because the electronics is inside. You know, you see the fabricated module. Electronics and the battery is inside this module. Antenna is outside. And this is a self-assembled uh, kind of, uh, uh, no, I should not self-assembled, it's a completely assembled uh, system which can work. So uh, here you see the simulated and measured. Uh, we had struggled a lot to get the wider bandwidth on the higher band. So, so the 900 megahertz and the 1.8 gigahertz, uh, and we had to do some tricks. So we got uh, good bandwidth for uh, GSM at both bands, 8.9% and 33%. And more importantly, the gain variation is less than or close to 7 dBs, which is kind of a standard. So you can see it's like a kind of a near isotropic pattern. Okay, uh, another, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm rushing a little bit. Another uh, uh, antenna on package, actually it's a combination of antenna on chip and antenna on package example, which I want to show you uh, is, is basically when you, when you realize antennas on a chip, you know, all familiar with ICs, integrated circuits and CMOS, they are not a conventional substrates for antenna implementation. This is just showing you the stack up where you have just the space from M6 to M1 to realize in few microns, eight microns or 10 microns, you need to realize and the, 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 the worst thing is that the substrate is very conductive. So you, or most of your power in a CMOS process, if you try to put an antenna there, most of your power gets absorbed by the substrate. So, so we were trying to put a, to do a project uh, on, on 71 gigahertz for this. Uh, and we want to, so we did a CMOS uh, process. In order to avoid the losses of the silicon substrate, we designed a, a artificial magnetic conductor surface. So people who are not familiar with the artificial magnetic conductor surface, this is basically an FSS structure or, or a high impedance surface, which is uh, backed by a ground plane. So, so you have a, a, a repetitive structure, uh, and then you have a, a ground plane at the bottom. Uh, what can this do? And this is showing the simulation model uh, of this uh, structure. What uh, this uh, is supposed to do? It is supposed to reflect the power which is going to the substrate in phase with the antenna. So if you look at the S11 phase versus frequency, at the frequency of interest where we are showing around 70, 71, 2 gigahertz, you see the phase of S11 is zero degrees. And this is uh, just a monopole antenna. The figure here shows, uh, this is a chip environment that you could see the, the AMC structure as well, the, the square patches. And on top of that is the monopole antenna and all around is are the driving circuits. So we did the circuits, uh, driving circuits uh, and, and as well as that. Now, we also saw that the, the higher the number of uh, the, the unit cells for AMC, you could get a better uh, gain, but then it kind of gets saturated. Uh, so we chose uh, a certain, uh, I think, four by six uh, to uh, fit it in within our chip. Now, this is the fabricated chip uh, in the CMOS process. You could see the monopole antenna. You could see the driving circuits. Now, this needs to be packaged now, right? So we are trying to do smart packaging so that package is also functional. This, we, we actually printed a super straight uh, on top of this on top of this chip. So this was uh, through a high permittivity material, so quarter wavelength, it acts like a transformer. And so it not only it boosts the directivity and gain, but it also protects the chip. 
So that's the advantage of this super straight. And then for the rest of the packaging, we thought, can we shape this package to be a lens so that it can further boost the performance? So we thought of a Fresnel lens, and this is how the structure looks like. So we have our chip, uh, and then we have uh, the super straight, which protects the chip, and then the overall package becomes like a Fresnel lens. Uh, and this just shows you the animation where you see that uh, the, the beam is getting focused, which means that we are getting more gain uh, out of it. Now, these are the printed uh, lens and the support layer and the super straight layer uh, in there. And uh, we got uh, immense boost in the performance by just smart packaging. So imagine this chip was supposed to be packaged without any performance bo uh, boost. But we designed the package in a way to printing that from a standalone Enteron chip, which was lossy, sitting on a lossy silicone, had a poor gain. We actually went all the way to get a, a positive 8.3 uh, dBi, or, or actually in practice, 7 dBi's of gain, uh, uh, which is a, almost like a boost of 19 and 20 dBs of the gain. So that's uh, the example of Enteron package or, or smart, uh, or, or smart uh, Enteron package. Okay. We did a number of other inks quickly, uh, not going to go into details. Reconfigurable antennas, uh, we did magnetic ink. We are actually able to make fully uh, compatible magnetic substrates of our own. So we can make magnetic substrates, which are typically very expensive. We've characterized them. They have decent magnetic properties. And we so this is an example where we showed a circular patch antenna on this magnetic substrate. The interesting thing is when you bias it, which means that you apply a, apply a DC magnetic field, you have change in the resonant frequency. And actually, you see two poles because of the RHCP and the LHCP both split. And you see LHCP and RHCP going in different directions. So you could have two resonant frequencies going in a different direction. So you could reconfigure them as per your liking on this magnetic substrate with a decent radiation performance. We also created recently a phase change material ink, which is basically to create a RF switch. This is a vanadium dioxide, which is an insulator at room temperature, and it becomes a conductor uh, at uh, when you heat it or when you pass current through it. So briefly, we created this uh, switch, RF switch. The advantage is that this is very low cost and it can work at millimeter wave frequencies. I was trying to order a switch from analog devices which can work at 30 gigahertz. It was $40 US. So I thought we can make low cost switches and then you don't need to solder them. Uh, these are tiny switches, it's, so soldering is difficult. So you could actually just uh, print that on the metal test. So here is an example where this switch is printed on an antenna, uh, is shown here, so the antenna is also printed and the black part is the switch. If, when the switch is activated, it acts as a, uh, when the switch is on, it acts as a PIFA, uh, and when it, uh, the switch is off, it is disconnected from the ground plane, it acts as a T-type antenna. You could clearly see two different modes operating. So, so we have done a lot of work based on the reconfigurable, tunable antennas based on these uh, printed switches. I'm going to skip this in view of time. This is a transparent ink which we have done, and we have done a lot of microwave absorbers. You could see the transparent absorbers. I'm going to skip this. Uh, energy harvesting modules, I also have to switch, uh, skip this. Uh, uh, we've all done fully printed and RF energy harvesting modules. There is a lot of work on that. This is a work done with a company in Canada on energy harvesting for, for the blood bags. Again, I'm sorry, I have to skip this. Uh, just lastly, in the last few minutes, uh, actually, I think I have one or two minutes left. I just want to show you uh, some examples of uh, wireless sensors. Uh, let's skip this. So this is a module which designed for environmental monitoring. Monitoring. So you could see that we made specialized inks. It's again a cube, and you have a very interesting antenna, which again kind of near isotropic printed on the sides. And we've also created uh, like different inks. For example, carbon nanotech inks to get gas sensors. Uh, p dot pss inks to get the temperature and hu humidity etc so you could just throw this this is a printed uh, module very cheap you could just throw this in environment for example near industry or uh, can detect forest fires can detect gas leaks can tell you humidity levels uh, can also tell you the the pollution in the environment very low cost and, and testing these are the kind of wireless sensing low cost modules which you could just drop and you could uh, do it and last uh, one which i want to show you is a smart bandage. Again, the IoT application, wireless sensing application, but wearable uh, for chronic wound patients. Uh, the chronic wound patients are those patients whose wound, wounds don't heal in time. So, so they keep on bleeding or they become ulcers uh, or they develop infections. 
So, so we were trying to make a system where the chronic wound patients do not need to go to the hospitals and they can stay in their home and office environment and their, uh, their, it can be monitored, their, their parameters can be monitored, wound condition can be monitored. So this is a bandage, standard bandage, we printed with special inks and we can, uh, this is just showing the electronics part, electronics part is reusable uh, and we can detect whenever the bleeding happens, how much bleeding happens and we can detect the pressure and we can also detect the pH level of uh, in the wound, which actually is indicative of if the wound is developing infection. All this is sent to a doctor through a Bluetooth link. Uh, uh, conveniently, it's, it's flexible, variable design, very low cost, and the bandage is disposable. So after one bleeding cycle, you could just throw the bandage, put the electronics on a new bandage. These are the kind of low cost wireless sensing examples. Uh, th that's the end of the technical talk. I just want to show you because this, this talk is for the Indian audience. Uh, their Indian researchers have been integral part of my group. Uh, currently, I have three uh, postdocs from India uh, working in my group, and there are many people who have actually uh, graduated from my group. Uh, for example, Gaurav, you know, who's now working as at ISRO in India and stuff like that. So I, I welcome more students, more researchers from India uh, in my group. Hopefully, this talk will help. Uh, disseminate some of our work and i want to thank uh, the the my group uh, you know who do this work and you know uh, and help me uh, to present these results thank you so much for your time and I, i'm i'm sorry to have rushed in the in the end thank you so much thank you dr Rafi, for such a wonderful talk uh, now uh, we we'll just quickly move to with uh, a few questions uh, as you can see in the chat box we we'll, from that we can take a few on so uh, okay. Okay, I, I, have to, yes, I have to go to the chat box, right? Okay, I, I'll read out, no problem, sir. Uh, I'm just trying to see how to go there. Otherwise, sir, I'll read out the question, sir. And, okay. Dr. Shoma Kandacharya is asking, what is the minimum feature size using this inkjet printing? And also, how to choose different materials of DRD printing as this may incur proper transition and matching in terms of design? Yeah, so uh, good question. I think in one of the slides I showed that the the older printer, I had an older printer from Dynamics Studio Film, it's a desktop printer. Um, it, it can go up to 20 microns. Reliably, repeatedly, you could say 50 microns. So 20 microns kind of pushing the limit, but 50 microns uh, of feature sizes, gaps and widths. And as I said, I have, I've got a new printer. So this is a new printer available in the market. It's a Japanese printer called SIJ, Super Inkjet Printer. And this can actually go down to feature size of one micron. So that's pretty uh, amazing. And, and you know, this field is developing so fast. Every now and then I see new printers and new techniques and new inks. So I'm pretty sure that you will be able to do some microns very soon. Now talking about materials, uh, uh, pretty much you could work with all the materials, you know, uh, we decided like, for example, last year we decided to work with vanadium dioxide. Uh, we just uh, got the, the, uh, the salt and the right materials. Of course, uh, there's some material science required in that. Uh, uh, you, you, you could buy some commercial